Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered how you can break free from the traps of productivity and start actually living your life? That's what we'll talk about today. Time is a created thing. To say I don't have time is like saying I don't want to. Lao Tzu. We talked about this book because it is so dense called 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berkman. And we've gone over this process of looking at how we look at time, how it destroys our attention, things that we can do to get towards the things that really matter to us and matter to our lives. And now we're going to take a look at what can we do to actually get to the place where we're focused on the things that really matter. This is a really interesting book. That's why I've spent so much time talking about it. I actually read it a while ago, and I didn't really understand how to do a podcast about it. Because first of all, it is very dense, but it's a lot of food for thought. I don't think that I agree with a lot of the ways he gets to where he gets to, but I agree with a lot of the conclusions he makes. Because so many people feel tied up in this perfectionism, in this must get more things done, and it keeps actually injuring them. And it's important for us to focus on the things, the people around us that matter the most, but also to get true rest. Because if our life is not valuable, and our time is not valuable, and our attention is not valuable, Those are the most important things, the things that we won't get more of. Everything else we could get more of, but not those three things. And so it's important for us to really guard those things so that we can actually achieve the thing that's the most important. It's our purpose in life, and it's going to make the biggest impact with everyone around us. And instead of all these checklists, We want to be able to focus on the things that are so important, that matter the most. So his first piece of advice is that we have to look at this idea that time is limited. We don't have this unlimited checklist of things that we need to do. We actually have to come up with a list of the ways we can actually get things done. That book, The One Thing, talked about the three most important things. I've seen time planners out there that will only allow you to identify two things on the task list that you're going to focus on. But essentially, when you come up with that number, and it's a very small number of the things that you're actually going to tackle, you're not allowed to put another thing on that list until you take something off. And he thinks that this number of lists should be 10 at the most. But in order for you to get that list, something else will have to come off of it. If you have some questions about that, listen to episode three of my podcast, where we talk about ruthlessly eliminating tasks that you don't need to be doing. He even gives the example that you should set a boundary of time. You're only going to work until this time. And when that time's up, you're done. And he talks about the book that we've talked about before, Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, and that we could just fill all the time we have available with us and we would feel really productive because we would be getting all these things done. But instead, the goal of task management is to be done at the end of work on time. Once we put that constraint in place, We'll actually be able to use our time more wisely, but also cut things out that are not worth our time. So put in that definitive number of items and be dedicated to finishing exactly on time. His second step is he says that you need to serialize your work, meaning you're going to focus on one thing at a time. You're not going to multitask. You're not going to do 13 things. You're not going to juggle six balls in the air while you're trying to eat lunch and do this and do that. Boy, that's my favorite thing. I don't like focusing on one project at a time. I like doing 17 projects all at the same time. That's really the thing that spoke to me in this book is that I need to focus and I need to bring it down to one thing at a time 
Right now I'm recording a podcast. I shouldn't be thinking about what I'm going to do this weekend. I shouldn't be thinking about what I'm going to do on Monday when I get back to work. I need to focus. And if we do that, we will actually reduce the amount of stress we have because we won't be trying to fill our time with too many things that we're not getting done at the same time. He says, three, that we should decide what we're going to fail at. And that's just another way about deciding what it is. It's just not going to get done. You know, maybe I have to mow the lawn this week, but I might trim some of that time out and it's going to look terrible. But you know what? My lawn will be mowed and my neighbors can talk about me. That's fine. They probably don't even notice because they're noticing how pretty their yard is. So again, if you sit there and think about what he calls strategic underachievement, where you're already deciding what you're not going to be great at, then you'll feel a lot better about that particular piece. We talked a little bit about that on episode five by prevent mistakes and look upstream. And the idea is that you're not giving up on doing a good job. You're going to decide on the things that don't need to have a perfect job. You have to be a good dad. You don't have to be a good lawnmower. You have to be a great spouse or a great friend, but you don't have to do a fantastic job at cleaning your stove. This comes from the book that we talked about with John Acuff, where he says to decide in advance what things you're going to bomb. You're going to remove the sting of shame. So again, if you're like me and you have a poorly kept lawn and you have some weeds growing in your flower bed, maybe that's okay because that's the thing I'm going to bomb at so that I can do better at other things. And that way, I don't feel shame about it. I don't feel embarrassed about it. It is what it is. I used to have these neighbors and they were hilarious because they would mow the lawn and he would mow. She had a broom and a dustpan behind her and she would sweep up the grass clippings from the lawnmower as he would mow. And then they would bag it all up. They would neatly tie them off and then they'd put them in the truck and drive them off to the city. There's nothing wrong with it. Their lawn looked amazing, but it made me wonder what else they could accomplish in this world that maybe would make them happier and make the world a better place if they weren't so dedicated to the lawn clippings in their yard. He says that we should also look at what we've done to have a done list as much as a to-do list. I use the app Todoist to keep track of my tasks. And if I ever feel like I need a little pep talk to myself, I click on the list of things I accomplished already. And I can see what I've done. And you know what? It does make you feel a lot better. I've come a long way. He says you want to get rid of some of the things that you, quote, care about. Meaning that if you're all wrapped up in politics, and you're all wrapped up on this piece of news or this thing on social media and this other thing that is going on in your town, limit the things that you are really going to worry about. I know at times when people have gotten upset about elections, I don't get upset about them. You know, whether I win or lose, I think, what am I willing to do to change the fate of the next election? Am I willing to donate? Am I willing to volunteer or am I just willing to go vote? And maybe some of you feel like you're not even willing to do that. But instead of getting wound up about everything, just decide that you're either going to do something about it and then come up with a task that you're willing to do or drop it. But you cannot be involved in all the drama of the world all the time. He says that we should embrace boring and singled purpose technology which is interesting, right? I mean, part of the problem we have with things like Facebook or Twitter is it's about everything. And it's always, all the time, always about everything. Instead of maybe having a more focused purpose. It's why I own a Kindle when I have 13 other devices I could be reading books on. I wanted something specifically that had no notifications, that couldn't browse the web, I couldn't match three of my favorite candies together and get an award, all it does is a book reader. And by having a single choice device where all it can do is let me read a book without any sort of distraction, that's the direction I decided to go for books. So if you can find different pieces of technology that can only do one thing, it'll help you focus. 
He suggests that we pay attention to the small things in life, things that are around us. We're always looking for bigger and better and noisier and more outlandish. When instead, there are simple joys around us, in our neighborhood, in the things that we have that will make our lives better. Someone started a map of all the cats in my neighborhood that like to sit in the window. And so then they created a chart for the kids to go around and say, can you find the two tabby cats that like to sit in the window? Those are my cats. And so then the kids would walk around the neighborhoods looking for all the cats sitting in the windows. And it was such a great thing to give kids something that they could do that is just about the small details in the life around them. He said that you should be a researcher in your relationships, which means you're trying to dig into what's going on in your relationships with the other person. Make those relationships better. Learn about your kids. Learn about your friends and invest in those people around you. He says that you should get to the point where you can be generous instantly. And I try to think of doing that. You know, sometimes when something happens in the world, I'll shoot off money without even thinking about it. I really feel better when I can be not a planner when it comes to my donation, but loose when looking at what's happening in the world around me and reacting to it to try to make it better. And then he says we should practice doing nothing. Sometimes it's about meditation. Sometimes it's about that true rest we were talking about, or maybe even having that hobby that just does nothing. Nothing useful. There's no goal in mind. We just do it to relax. So this book is a long haul. I think it's really an interesting read. I think he has a lot of great ideas when it comes to productivity. And again, he's not saying these things because he hates it. He's saying these things because he's been through it. He was the productivity guy with the task list and the to-do list and all the things that he was trying to get done. And it wasn't until he realized these things that he wrote in this book that he started having a fulfilling life where he was actually doing his real purpose, his true goals, the thing that was making the world a better place and not just every task that's on his task list. So my challenge to you is now that you found out what types of things are stealing your attention, what types of things are stealing your time, what types of things do you have to focus on, and what things should you be focusing on, try to come up with a list of four things that you could get rid of or you could plan to fail at. So I can't get rid of mowing the lawn, but I certainly can be terrible at it and not give it another thought. All right, everyone, thanks so much for doing this long haul with me on this book. I hope it gave you something to think about. So please remember to leave a review and tell your friends that they can focus on what's really important and plan to fail by taking small steps.